Custom House is an introduction of sorts to the Scarlet Letter. While it doesn't actually give any information crucial to the understanding of the novel, it's still an important part of the book because it adds an extra layer of meaning. We'll get back to that in a few minutes, but first it's important to understand who Nathaniel Hawthorne was, because this plays a big part in the book, and in all of his writing in general. Nathaniel Hawthorne was born in 1804 in Salem, Massachusetts. He was the great-great-great-grandson of John Hawthorne, who was one of the presiding judges in the Salem Witch Trials. Hawthorne felt so much shame at the connection to the Salem Witch Trials that he even chose to change the spelling of his name to cause there to be less association between himself and his great-great-grandfather. Because of his family's long-standing connections to Salem, Hawthorne experienced a great deal of conflict. While he was really proud of his family's um, work and effort to help found the country, they were some of the first settlers of Massachusetts and the United States. He also felt guilt regarding his family's role in the Salem Witch Trials, and he also felt a great deal of curiosity and confusion Regarding the Puritan lifestyle, it wasn't something he really understood and felt a great deal of disapproval regarding. So we've got Hawthorne with this general both fascination and shame regarding his family's Puritan history. And part of him trying to solve this or deal with this is him writing. And you'll find that in most of what Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote, there's some sort of tie to the Puritan lifestyle as he's trying to fit, use writing as a way of figuring out his family's history. Hawthorne also wanted to be a writer, but he also needed a means of supporting himself and his family. Writing really was not a lucrative career. He worked as a result at a custom house. What a custom house was is a place where people would pay customs or taxes on foreign goods once they were imported. Salem being a port city had a custom house where ships would come in, people would then go pay taxes on the goods that they were importing into the country. So he worked as a custom surveyor, which is just another word for tax collector. As he's working as a tax collector though, he's also trying to write with varying degrees of success. The Custom House had political ties, and thus when a new politician would come into control, those working at the Custom House may or may not lose their job, and this is exactly what happened to Hawthorne. When the area saw a new leader come into play, Hawthorne ended up losing his job. He took this as an opportunity to become a full-time writer, and fortunately for him, it did work out. He became incredibly successful. In fact, Herman Melville dedicated the novel Moby Dick to Hawthorne. Now on to the Scarlet Letter. The novel is set in the 1600s. Custom House, however, is set in the 1800s. So we've got 200 years removed from the novel and this forward. It sets up the book as a piece of historical fiction. Custom House tells the story of an unnamed narrator. He is the man who will tell the story of Hester Prynne, the protagonist of The Scarlet Letter. The narrator and Hawthorne share a lot of parallels. First, both Hawthorne and the narrator are of Puritan descent. We also have the narrator acting as a common house surveyor or a tax collector, just like Hawthorne. Similarly, we also have the narrator as an author, or a man trying to be an author, but unable to because of the need to provide for himself. So this narrator, he works at the Custom House just like Hawthorne did, and he's an extremely bored man. He works with people he generally considers to be incompetent idiots. They only have their jobs because of family connections, not necessarily their quality of work or their work ethic. Salem has been in recent years decreasing in its port status as more and more ships are going instead to Boston. So as a result, the narrator doesn't have a whole lot of work to do. There's not a whole lot of customs to be collected. And he's stuck with 
these boring people who really shouldn't be working there. He finds some old papers while going through items stored in the second floor of the building, which really isn't used anymore. So he's on the second floor, he finds a pile of old papers, and they're bundled with a tattered letter A. The narrator picks up the letter A and examines it. He realizes it was meant to decorate clothing, and he holds it up to his chest to try and see how it was worn. He writes, It seemed to me then that I almost experienced a sensation not altogether physical, yet almost so, as of burning heat, and as if the letter were not of red cloth but red-hot iron. I shuddered and involuntarily let it fall upon the floor. Here the author indicates that the scarlet letter is going to come to be of importance. Intrigued, he decides to read the letters that the A was bundled with. Reading through the letters, he discovers that they were written a hundred years ago by a former surveyor, Jonathan Pugh, who tells about a woman who lived in Salem one hundred years before his time, so two hundred years before the time of the narrator. This woman, Hester Prynne, was a remarkable woman who nursed and cared for the poor. Within the document, though, he also found mention of Hester's scarlet letter. Intrigued by the story, he decided to write a fictionalized version of Hester's experience. The custom house, with the boring work and boring people, saps any motivation from the narrator, though. When politics change and he loses his job, he is able to focus on writing and thus writes the scarlet letter. Why, though, is the custom house included? It's the story of the narrator, not the story of Hester Prynne. It takes place, in fact, 200 years after these events. So, this part of the story is not necessary to understand the plot of the Scarlet Letter. However, Hawthorne included it because it adds an additional perspective and an additional layer of meaning and insight to the novel. First, it gives us insight into Hester. At the start of the novel, Hester's made out to be pretty bad, some even thinking she should have been put to death for her actions. Here, though, we have the mention of a woman who's an angel. This gives us hope as we read, and also a task as we read. So it's important, the narrator lets us know, that we look for examples of how society's view of Hester is changing throughout the novel. This part of the book also aligns the narrator with Hester. This isn't the most obvious alliance, a 17th century woman with a 19th century man, but both are outsiders and as, and as such, the narrator is able to empathize with Hester. Finally, this introduces us to the narrator. This is important because this is not the typical third-person story where the narrator just tells what's happening. This narrator interrupts the story, bringing our attention away from the plot, and serves to remind us that this is just a story. This is called romantic irony. For example, the narrator writes, It seemed to me, the reader may smile, but must not doubt my word. It seemed to me then that I experienced, and he goes on to tell about his experience, but he's bringing attention to you as the reader, and to himself as the writer, not allowing you to get completely lost in the story by bringing attention to himself and the process of writing, he's making sure that we are aware that this is a work that he has created. By bringing attention to himself, he is also able to bring attention to what is important. He often tells us what to look for. Think of him as a friend who will help you as you read. He'll be telling you what's important. So this leaves us with two things to look for as you read. First, the evolution of Hester's treatment by society. And second, the narrator's comments, which will indicate what's important.